Good afternoon to all of you who are tuning in from the East Coast and good day to all of you who are with us from elsewhere. Really glad you're back. It's our first program in March. And although it's a little bit gloomy as I peer out uh, here in New York City, um, certainly, you know, we've had some balmy weather uh, and with any luck, we'll have more of spring around the corner. And uh, as we move into the spring season, we are plenty busy. We have lots of information that we wanna share in a variety of practice areas that we think are relevant to all of you. And so uh, with that in mind, Kathy, if you go to the next slide, please, the agenda, thank you. Um, you will get a flavor as to what we're going to cover today. Um, after I walk through this, I'll also be uh, giving you some highlights of what's going on in uh, the budget, specifically, excuse me, New York and uh, otherwise in the broader policy spaces. After that, Barbara Lee and Kamisha Parkins will be with us. Uh, Barbara has been on the program numerous times and uh, Kamisha as well is coming back. And together they will address uh, an important topic um, in the context of higher education, fostering faculty collegiality. It is difficult to uh, really execute on that well, and there are a variety of legal, let alone practical challenges that they'll bring to your attention. After that, Liz Heifetz, who's around the corner from me here in New York City, um, she is going to talk with you about some important deadlines and uh, other pieces of data relevant to those of you in the immigration world, particularly as it relates to your hiring and otherwise your efforts to uh, keep your workforce vibrant. Then after that, we'll be hearing from Sanjeev de Souza, uh, who's with us from our Albany office, and Emily Alquist, also in Albany, who together will be addressing recent decisions that apply New York State's new sexual harassment standards. And then I will close things out with uh, your questions. Um, all of these times are essentially our best estimates. Of course, uh, we're interested, though, in hearing what you have to say. And if you have questions along the way that we can address, it's our pleasure to do that. And so if, Kathy, you'd go to the next slide, please allow me just to dive into the content. So with regard to the New York state budget, I alluded to the fact that, uh, and so has uh, Kristen Smith when she's been presenting uh, as host, that right now we are kind of in the midst, in the thick of the budget process. We still haven't seen those one house bills, although we expect them to be imminent. And uh, we know that there are in New York state a number of knotty issues. Um, there is of course a lot being discussed around education. Um, in particular around funding in districts with, uh, you know, according to some definitions, declining enrollment. This comes out of the budget language. Um, and that has been a place where there has been a lot of active debate um, in advance of the issuance of these one house bills, um, which are functionally advisory only, but have a huge amount of power, as it were, in the negotiating process, essentially making it clear what the legislature's priorities are and are not. Um, in terms of Medicaid, we have been very much focused on that. You heard earlier um, during this process last month from Roger Bearden, for instance, uh, who's co-deputy chair with me of the Government and Regulatory Affairs Group, and we were talking about the, the various healthcare implications um, that are inherent in this budget. And a lot of the dust has not yet settled, so we are tracking it closely. But for today, there isn't really a hard and fast update to give you. Certainly by next week, we expect more and even more so as we get deeper into March. Why don't we go to the next slide, please, Kathy, because I'd like to share some context. Right now, while there is a lot in flux with the budget, it's also important to note that in the New York State uh, Assembly, as well as in the Senate, there are a number of long-standing um, members of each of those bodies that is uh, ready to say it's time to move on. And that is not an atypically high number per se, um, but it's a bunch of announcements all at once. Um, and it's more change than we've seen um, than we have in recent memory. It, it's not like records are being broken here, but there's some big names uh, on their way. And for instance, just yesterday, we heard that Helene Weinstein is on her uh, way and has, um, after 44 years nearly, 
uh, serving her district decided that uh, she is ready for what's next. And so um, these are some of the key players uh, that I've listed out on the slide who um, have already made their intentions known. And that means that while this current budget negotiation will be defined by the individuals who are both on this list as well, those who are remaining in each of the two legislative bodies, uh, things will look different uh, come next year. And it just uh, was something we wanted to make sure you had an awareness about. Next slide, please. So while all of this is happening within uh, the state realm in New York, which is, of course, a place where we uh, spend some extra uh, time and focus, um, given you know where um, many of our clients are tuning in from, no matter where you are in the country, uh, everyone is paying attention to the uh, presidential election, which has um, significant implications ultimately in terms of uh, where things uh, shake out at regulatory levels and otherwise uh, within the proverbial administrative state that affects uh, many of your businesses. And so uh, we know that um, there is a lot yet to be determined with regard to um, you know, what the ultimate matchup will be, um, but it looks fairly strong at this point that we're likely to see former President Trump uh, against President Biden for the Republican and Democratic nominations, respectively. And today is Super Tuesday, where there are more than a dozen states that are going through the primary process. This could be the day after which, depending on results, when um, former Governor uh, Haley uh, is either you know inclined to remain in the race or to step aside uh, on the Republican side. Um, there's a lot yet that you know we don't know, but we'll be tracking it and we'll keep all of you apprised. So again, just to note that there will be more programming to come here as we all learn more together. Next slide, please. So thank you, Kathy. That's all I have to share, um, you know, in terms of updates for this morning, because again, or this afternoon, I should say, because we have. Um, plenty of good content ahead and more will be defined, particularly in the New York State budgetary environment as we get deeper into this month. But for now, let me take the time to introduce our two uh, next speakers, one of whom is Barbara Lee, who is of counsel, and she comes to us um, you know, after many previous presentations to this group, and of course, an esteemed career in higher education law, including um, stints with Rutgers University and elsewhere around the country, and is known as really one of the uh, top minds in higher education law in the country. I don't think that is an overstatement at all. Um, and Kamisha Parkins, who is here as a um, trainee uh, being supervised by Barbara, uh, Kamisha has been on our program before. Kamisha sits around the corner from me here in New York City, um, and uh, we're delighted that you know Kamisha is growing her uh, career here at Bond and has the opportunity to present as well on this topic. And so I'll turn it over to Barbara to uh, begin the presentation. And Barbara, again, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you, Gabe, for uh, the, the invitation. It's nice to be back. Next slide, please. Um, we all understand that tenure and academic freedom are very important protections for faculty members, but they don't protect faculty from, for example, flagrant violations of institutional policies or serious non-collegial behavior. Many faculty and administra administrators believe, incorrectly I might say, that tenure and academic freedom shield faculty from behavior that is inappropriate or unprofessional or non-collegial. College leaders have a right to expect faculty and staff, for that matter, to collaborate and cooperate with their colleagues and academic administrators. What a, what a thought. Even at public institutions, not all speech is protected. The Supreme Court told us that in the Garcetti case in 2006, that public employee speech related to one's job duties is not protected by the First Amendment. We were all quite shocked to understand that. There's no exceptions in that case for faculty and in academic uh, positions, but some lower courts have created uh, exceptions for speech related to teaching or to scholarly writing. And at private colleges, faculty handbooks or policies or collective bargaining agreements may require collegial or professional conduct. They also may provide protections for speech. Uh, finally, the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, has released statements that I'm sure you folks in higher education are very familiar with, 
1940 Statement on Academic Freedom and Tenure, and also the Statement on Professional Ethics. Both of these statements uh, deal with faculty responsibilities as well as faculty rights. And finally, and Kamisha is going to, to tell us about this next bullet, courts have almost unanimously backed institutional responses uh, with respect to non-collegial behavior. So Kamisha is going to take us briefly through some of these relevant cases. And we need the next slide, please. And Kamisha, take it away. Thank you, Barbara, and hello, everyone. Uh, so as Barbara mentioned, courts have uh, backed institutional responses to uh, varying degrees of uncollegial conduct. And uh, the most recent case involving collegiality is uh, the Porter versus the Board of Trustees of North Carolina State University case. And this case was decided in July of 2023. Uh, specifically in this case, there were three, three incidents which raised a question of the plaintiff's collegiality. Uh, the tenured North Carolina State professor, Stephen Porter, uh, he questioned the addition of a diversity question to student course evaluations during a department meeting. And in another instance, he criticized colleagues on a faculty search committee via a department-wide email for considering a controversial uh, candidate they had accepted as a finalist for an uh, open position. And, and then he uh, most recently wrote a blog post uh, about the Association for the Study of Higher Education titled, titled ASHE Has Become a Woke Joke. And as a result of these incidents, uh, North Carolina State did remove Porter uh, from a PhD program in the Department of Leadership, Policy, and Human Development on grounds that he was insufficiently collegial. So Porter alleged in response to that, uh, that university administrators retaliated against his First Amendment rights. Uh, Kathy, you can go to the next slide. And uh, in reaching its decision, uh, the majority clarified the test to be used when faculty claim that they had been punished for otherwise protected speech. And just to you know, outline the, the test here, first, a court must determine whether the faculty member was speaking about a matter of public concern or whether the speech at issue was related to the faculty member's job and thus the individual was speaking as a public employee. And if we determine that the faculty member was speaking as a public employee, we must then determine whether his speech related to quote, scholarship or teaching. And if it did not, then it is unprotected pursuant to the case that Barbara previously mentioned, Garcetti. So uh, the Fourth Circuit here, they did affirm the trial court's dismissal of the plaintiff's claim, upholding the administrator's decision to remove him from the PhD program because the topic of his speech was not a matter of public concern and uh, his speech as an employee was not related to his scholarship or teaching. And so the Supreme Court uh, earlier this year actually declined to hear the case uh, which, and also without comment, which allows the Fourth Circuit decision to stand. And, you know, while the Supreme Court denial does not imply an approval of what the Fourth Circuit decided, it does tend to suggest some indication that uh, the case was correctly resolved on its merits. Kathy, you can go to the next slide. And, uh, so generally, there are similar circumstances which lead to academic administrators and often the individual's faculty colleagues to seek to discipline an individual who is disruptive, divisive, uh, and or engages in verbal attacks against faculty colleagues. And the most common forms of discipline sought and upheld by courts are uh, typically a faculty's dismissal and a faculty's denial of tenure. So I've cited a bunch of cases that have uh, been decided in recent years that relate to collegiality. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight two uh, cases which uh, show 
where a dismissal of a faculty member was upheld and the denial of tenure. So uh, turning to the dismissal of faculty, uh, in the Burton versus Board of Regents of the University of Wisconsin system case, uh, the trial and appellate courts upheld the dismissal of a tenured faculty member who had disclosed private information uh, by posting recordings of faculty meetings online. Um, it was frequently disrespectful, harassing, and intimidating um, in his behavior toward colleagues, despite being warned in two formal letters uh, to desist such behavior. So in that case, again, uh, the dismissal of, uh, dismissal of him from the faculty was upheld. And turning to the uh, cases where there was an upholding of the denial of the tenure of a faculty member, in Davis, uh, versus Western Carolina University, which was uh, decided by the Fourth Circuit, the same circuit in which Porter was decided. The trial and appellate courts uh, here upheld the denial of the tenure of a professor who had engaged in numerous instances of gross misconduct, including but not limited to a poem he wrote depicting the rape of the college's dean, uh, a story he wrote about killing a faculty member, and threats directed against uh, those involved in the tenure process. Uh, so in this case, the court completely rejected the professor's assertion that he was denied tenure on the basis of what he alleged uh, was his mental disorder. And so I, I encourage uh, really all of you to look into all of the decisions that I've cited here, as particularly our higher education institution clients, uh, for a valuable insight into how to approach collegiality in your specific workplaces. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. So for those of you who tune in regularly to this seminar, um, it's wonderful to be able to give you good news because we don't always, we're not always able to give you good news uh, on these weekly webinars, but clearly in this, for this particular topic, there's a clear consensus among the courts uh, that it, universities and college may anticipate, may, may expect, um, Tenured, even non-tenured faculty to behave in a professional manner. And uh, will, they will support a college or university's action against the individual if they do not do that. Uh, this means that the courts are actually deferring to the institution's academic judgment about how individuals ought to behave who, who uh, teach and do research at our institutions. So I would urge you to encourage your academic leaders, department chairs, deans, please do uh, encourage them to deal promptly and decisively within professional and uncollegial conduct because they not only will they be doing this to, for the benefit of your institution, but the courts will very likely say, good job. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, let me say thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Kamisha. Really appreciate this important and thoughtful presentation that you've provided. And I would like now to shift to our next topic and our next presenter, um, Liz Heifetz, who, as I noted, uh, is sitting around the corner uh, here in New York City, um, is back on the program. And Liz, who focuses on a wide array of immigration matters uh, for bond clients and who also is very active in our pro bono space. In fact, she has presented on our pro bono programming previously. She's here to talk about uh, updates uh, in terms of immigration and relating uh, filing fees, which yes, may be technical, but it's critical for you to know about. And so uh, Liz, we're glad that you're here with us to walk us through the why and the when and all the other pieces that make this important. Sounds good, thanks Gabe. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna try not to keep you too long. Um, just to provide you with an update for those that have employees that are foreign nationals, you know, where this is going to affect non-immigrants, it's going to affect immigrant visa processing, it's going to affect a lot. Usually, anytime there's um, a filing fee increase, it's it's very technical, but at the same time, um, it's very minimal. And this time, it's huge. It affects almost every visa category from H's to L's to F's to J's to everything. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of a background about what's happening, what to keep in mind, um, what to look out for, you know, when you make decision making as to who to hire, who you want to sponsor, who you want to continue sponsoring, who you want to, you know, seek permanent residence for, so on and so forth. Um, so Kathy, can we jump to the first slide, please? Um, okay, so the premium processing updates is a big one because 
the, the way this works is so for, the way the immigration service adjudicates applications, normally regular processing without any premium, it takes about three months, four months, and they kind of can take however long they want. I've had some that come in at six months and nine months, and it doesn't matter what category it is. Um, so most clients uh, have done premium processing because that, you know, it they it promises essentially adjudication within 15 calendar days, which is an excellent way of making sure your case doesn't get lost in, you know, the ether space that, you know, the immigration service can be. Um, now they're kind of closing that up a little bit. And now it's not 15 calendar days, it's 15 business days, which is essentially from two weeks to going to three weeks. Um, and also, obviously, the fee, as you can see here, is being updated um, to from 2500 which is for most categories for employment-based visas. It'll be that one. I've specified here which categories apply to smaller companies versus larger companies. Um, and again, if you have any specific questions as regards to clients or employees, let us know, and I'll walk you through in detail as to what pertains to you. The general um, kind of takeaway here is the USCIS Stabilization Act established the current processing fees um, and the authority um, by the Department of Homeland Security to adjust these fees on a biannual basis. So we're kind of in that period now. Um, these fees, they did remain unchanged for about three years following the passage of the act. Um, but DHS now is, you know, honing in on it and increasing all of the premium processing fees on all forms, all categories. Um, essentially is to kind of reflect the amount of inflation uh, between June of 21 and June of 23 um, as per the consumer price index for all urban consumers. So this will be a big one. They just went into effect on February 26. So anything that is being postmarked after this date, I mean, at this point is we're already in March. So everything should be the new fee category. And again, like I said, this applies to almost every single category, um, depending on the kind of company you are, depending on the kind of visa I've listed here, um, what the bump is, um, depending on that. So once you review your employee's information and the documents will be able to kind of tell what, you know, what your upgrade fee is. Um, so Kathy, can we go to the next slide? So these are essentially the other increases. These are taking place effective April 1st. And again, that's postmarked. The immigration service is very much a stickler for um, the receipt of fees and applications. So um, even though it is postmarked, I would always recommend that if you're sending out a petition and it is urgent, um, send it out earlier, send it out at least a week or two earlier, because even though they say it's supposed to be postmarked by April 1st, they usually make their decisions based on the actual receipt of the application, the petition, and the check. Um, a great way to always check if it's been receipted is if you call and make sure, first of all, make sure your check has been cashed. If your check has been cashed, you can call the immigration service. It's almost in, you know very difficult to get through to them. You have to say the magic word of info pass to get through to them. Once you do that, um, they will be able to provide you with a receipt number, even if you haven't received the receipt. So just something to look out for when you do that. Um, one of the main you know, petitions that is being filed, especially now with H-1B cap season opening up actually tomorrow at noon, um, the H-1B petitions, the current fee is, is being bumped, as you can see, uh, for most companies. If you're over 25 employees, then it's considered a large company. And these will be the fees that you can refer back to. Um, you can also refer, you know, re email me at any point in time, like I said, and I can let you know specifically what fee pertains to you. Um, interesting thing about H-1B petitions, actually, now that we're actually in that, you know, H-1B lottery season, for any one of you that is um, entering employees in the H-1B cap lottery tomorrow, um, between tomorrow and the end of March, just to, you know, so you're thinking ahead about when you decide who to enter. Um, the registration fee right now is still $10 just to enter them in the lottery. This is pre-filing. If they're selected, these are the fees you would be applying. But just so you know, next year for the 2026 fiscal year, um, you know, so the March 2025 cap lottery, the registration fee is getting bumped from $10 to 215 per registration, which is essentially about almost a 3,000% surge. So the like, you know, the reason for this, I would suspect is, you know, just so um, employers are much more diligent in choosing who to enter um, and also not double entering. And they've, they've been making a lot of regulatory updates to how the cap lottery works. Um, but just, you know, thinking ahead, 
you know, if you were planning to maybe enter someone next year, oh, I'll enter someone else. Oh, I want to, you know, see how this employee pans out for the next year or two, and then I'll enter next year. Um, that's all fine, but just know that the registration fee is being bumped. Um, and the quota of selections still remains as 85,000 for regular. And I believe it's about 20,000 for master's advanced um, degrees. So again, if you have any specific questions as it pertains to that, please do let me know. Uh, L visas, which is another intercompany transfer visa, it's also being bumped incredibly high um, from 460 to 1385. For L visas, I will just provide the following kind of advice here. If you can have your um, employee apply at the consulate of their home country, the US consulate there, it's better, it's cheaper, they don't have the same costs, and the scrutiny at the consular level is much, much, much less, especially for L's. That's an extremely difficult visa to get approved. It I mean, we do them all the time, but they the threshold in USCIS is extremely high. They will usually uh, send through a request for evidence uh, to respond. So if you can, you, you know, to avoid the whole USCIS route, I would recommend applying at the consulate, especially for initial L's. Um, similarly with O's, less common, but again, this is ex extraordinary petitions, um, also being bumped high. I think it's must, must be kind of a deterrent from filing applications. Um, I will say because the H-1B cap season is coming up, a lot of individuals that, you know, have no alternative visas, you know, who are maxing out on their student visas or J visas or something, they want to quickly find another visa to get on. And so poss one possible interpretation for why some of these fees are higher um, is to, it could be a deterrent, you know, from trying to apply in different visa categories just to see if you get in, you know, obviously taking into account that every petition still has to be filed in good faith, knowing that, you know, it, there is the, 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 the employee actually meets, you know, the eligibility requirements. So all that needs to say is, you know, just be aware of these things that are popping up. Um, Kathy, can we go to the next slide? Um, again, so this is continuing on for more immigrant like petitions, E's, investor visas, TNs. TNs is another one where I would say apply at the border. Those are for Canadian and Mexican nationals. Apply at the border if at all possible. Um, Mexico, you have to make an appointment at the consulate, but all of that to say is you will avoid all these fees if you do it at the consular level. TNs are subject to that. The rest, ease you can do at the consulate as well. The rest of them have to be done through USCIS. But again, you know, let us know. We will walk you through it because each of these has a specific nuance, specific things to take care of. Um, but just be aware that the increases also apply to these as well. And the rest of them, the I-45s, the I-90s, the N-400s, these are all uh, immigrants visas um, and, you know, adjustment of status applications. They're being bumped up also, and they will. these will continue to be bumped up every year. Uh, and the level of increments will just kind of be dependent upon, you know, they'll say inflation or something in that, in that general category. Um, but just things to keep in mind when you decide, you know, if you want to sponsor someone long-term, if someone has been working for you on their visa and they're reaching their max out date on, you know, their seven year on their L or, you know, they're maxing out on their age, you have to make a decision whether you're going to permanently sponsor them, in which case you have to file one of these applications. Or, you know, you essentially will have to terminate their employment if you cannot find an alternative way to keep them employed. Um, so, I get, like I said, very, a lot of these can be very technical, but if you have any specific questions, you know, reach out. We'll walk you through specifically what you need to know, how best to decide, to strategize um, when you make these decisions. But costs are increasing, so this will be a, you know, there, this is a substantial fee increase. It hasn't happened in a while. Um, so, just be aware of this as you, you move forward. Um, and next slide. Um, and this is just more additional kind of information as to additional fees. You should, you know, refer back to, you know, these numbers if you want to just confirm and to see what is what. Um, all of them are listed here. If anything else pops up, we usually provide a client alert and update and we'll show you that as well. Um, any additional questions, feel free to reach out. But that's kind of in a nutshell, what kind of what to expect, fee increases, anything of that nature. Um, anyone who's entering employees in H-1B cap lottery tomorrow, good luck. Um, hopefully everyone gets selected. Um, and if not, you know, hopefully maybe there will be a second lottery in July, depending on, you know, the people entered and we'll go from there. But again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and we'll go through everything in detail as you want. Thanks. Liz, thank you. As always, you have 
much to share and you've uh, really given this group a useful update, particularly those um, who are worrying about uh, the various dynamics here, not just the fees, but the lotteries and all that you highlighted and uh, there are many moving parts. So we appreciate this time. Uh, to all of you who have been wondering, and we've received a variety of questions in the chat, when will we be here at Bond discussing uh, COVID-19 and the CDC and all that came out uh, late last week? The short answer is we are still making sure we digest it and nuance it in a way that's uh, really uh, right and certain. And so we are going to be presenting on it, we expect, next week. Um, look for more um, in the context of that program, which Kristen will be hosting. And if there's an opportunity to provide any interim written update, uh, we'll get it out to all of you uh, through our usual uh, mailing lists and the like. So stay tuned. We know that you're interested uh, in this, as are we, and we want to make sure that we give you uh, the best guidance possible. So um, before um, you know, we close, we have one other presentation, uh, a really important one at that. We're going to be hearing from Sanjeev D'Souza, who's with us from Albany, and Emily Alquist, also from Albany. Sanjeev is uh, one of the leaders of our firm um, in a variety of different ways uh, and uh, is a key uh, voice in our labor and employment practice. Um, I also want to note that Emily and I have had the pleasure of working uh, very uh, frequently together in her relatively shorter tenure at Brown, uh, not at, at Bond, excuse me, um, when um, Emily was a summer associate. Um, I had the chance to get to know Emily, and now that Emily has uh, chosen to join us, um, we continue to work in partnership. And uh, what we're going to be uh, hearing about from Sanjeev and from Emily is about recent decisions applying New York State's uh, sexual harassment standards. There's been a lot that has changed in recent uh, vintage that you know is now actually getting applied, and we're seeing essentially how um, it's all being interpreted. So Sanjeev, I don't want to take more of your time as well. Emily's, we're thrilled to have you back on the program. It's been a little while, but we're thrilled to have you back. Thanks, Gabe. Uh and thanks everyone for joining us. Greetings from Albany. Uh, so as Gabe mentioned, we are we're, we want to uh, provide a bit of an update here, and uh, it relates to New York State's human rights law and the, the change to the harassment standard uh, that went into effect. And actually, it wasn't. A, it, this is not quite a recent change. This actually took effect in October of 2019, as many of you will remember. Uh, what we wanted to report on is some information that we were able to get through a FOIL request to the Division of Human Rights on how the division judges have ruled on uh, sexual harassment cases under new, this new harassment standard. So that is what a Emily and I will focus on uh, in our few moments uh, today and happy to talk about it further with any of you offline. So just briefly, the background here, and many of you will also recall, the old standard for harassment claim under New York's human rights law was that the harassing conduct uh, was uh, sort of discriminatory in its in intimidating, ridiculing, or insulting the employee, and it was sufficiently severe or pervasive. And that was a relatively heightened standard. It looked at the, from a from a severity standpoint, Things like the the uh, the actual single act, how severe and and harmful it was from a pervasive standpoint, how frequently it were things occurring, and in order to be able to sustain that claim, the complaining employee would have to be able to show that there was significant events that were going on. And they can establish that. In October of nineteen, this standard was amended and it was lowered. And replacing the severe and pervasive standard was uh, essentially a, a new threshold that said this, that if the, the conduct subjects the employee to inferior terms, conditions, or privileges of employment, that would constitute harassing conduct and sustain a claim. The affirmative defense that was available to employers now at this point was to be able to show that that conduct did not rise above the level that a reasonable victim who belonged to the same protected class would consider to be uh, a petty slight or a trivial inconvenience. 
Now, what we were all dealing with as counsel and that you dealt with as employers is, well, how does petty slights and trivial inconveniences uh, compare to the old standard? And after uh, the law took effect, of course, we then got hit by COVID and that changed the dynamics within the agency in terms of processing of claims, when, thing, when decisions were issued. And we went a couple of years, we really didn't see anything coming out, no guidance on the standard or actual decisions. So we had submitted a FOIL request to the state in December of 22, asking that they provide us with any decisions, either from an ALJ within the division or the commissioner, ruling on this new standard as it applied to sexual harassment claims. And in, it took a little while, but the division uh, finally provided us with a response to these uh, to our FOIL request and produced a number of decisions on, in uh, within the last couple of months. We've gone through them and wanted to share with you some some takeaways that we found uh, from the decisions. And unfortunately, it's a fairly limited universe of cases. They they produced four decisions where they actually uh, applied this new standard. And all the decisions were issued in between April and July of 23. So the complaints were filed anywhere between October of 19 and early 2020, uh, February or March. But again, because of COVID and the impact it had, it took quite a while before those cases uh, went through the division's pipeline and eventually got to a hearing and a decision. But with that being said, I'm going to comment on three of the cases, and Emily is going to pick up on the fourth, and then we'll share just a couple of takeaway points for you. So uh, one decision that we wanted to talk about and I'll cover uh, was a, a case that was brought by a complainant uh, in against the Office of uh, Office for the Persons with Developmental Disabilities, known as OPWDD. This was a complaint that was filed in early 2020, and the decision was issued in July. And the complainant, a female who was also identified as a, uh, a Asian and and uh, and brown, uh, raised claims both under gender and race discrimination. Her uh, gender claims, which focus on sexual harassment, alleged that there were there were three things that happened. Uh, in, actually, in her case, there was two things. There was a, a pregnancy test that she claimed was left in the workplace for others to see, and that employees were discussing her pregnancy during work hours. And those were the claims that were the basis of her uh, sexual harassment. In that case, the, the division judge dismissed that claim, applying the new standard, and it found, and the judge found that the gossip that she was uh, complaining about Although it concerned her pregnancy, it did not rise to the level that it altered the terms and conditions of her employment. And in that particular case, though, what was crucial was that the complainant was only able to speculate about why others may have uh, gossiped about her, her uh, pregnancy, and she didn't have knowledge of the substantive content of the gossip. So specific to those factual limitations, the judge found that that was not enough to sustain a claim of harassment. She also had made a claim about the pregnancy test being left uh, available for others to see. Again, that claim was dismissed. The judge found that what was relevant there was it, the complainant acknowledged that the pregnancy test was one that she had actually brought into the workplace and somehow had it had found its way into an area that uh, it, it was publicly visible. So uh, again, somewhat unique to the circumstances, but found that these were not the types of incidents that rose above the petty slights or trivial inconveniences standard. So that's one decision. Uh, another one was a case brought in, again, early 2020 by a female complainant against another uh, public entity. This, in this case, it was the Onondaga County. Uh, and this in, in this particular case, the complainant worked for a juvenile detention facility operated by the county. The facts of this case involved the complainant being part of a group of employees that had brought a sexual harassment internal complaint against a co-worker. The county had investigated this case, uh, substantiated the complaint, and as corrective action had moved that co-worker to a different site. 
the complainant's claims were based on three incidents where that form, the, uh, co the co-worker had appeared at her work site again. The first two incidents occurred under the old severe and pervasive standard. The third incident occurred after the new standard took effect. The, the division judge in that case also dismissed those claims, finding that the first two incidents where the, the, the uh, co-worker had reappeared did not rise to this level of uh, sufficient severity or pervasiveness to, to meet the old standard. The new standard was not met with respect to the third incident where the, the co-worker appeared. And again, somewhat fact-specific because the co-worker did not have any interaction with the complainant. There were no comments or actions taken by that co-worker towards the complainant. And there was actually a physical separation between the two where they didn't actually cross paths. The complainant just saw the co-worker on the property. So again, the, the ALJ in that case found that that was not sufficient uh, to, to uh, meet that threshold of a petty slight or trivial inconvenience, dismissed that claim. The, the ALJ did also note, and I think this is relevant to the question of, of uh, the employer's ability to show that it did not condone the conduct, is that as soon as it was reported by the complainant that this coworker was on site, they immediately escorted the coworker away. So the judge said, even though the employer's conduct in or the corrective action that it took in response to the initial internal harassment complaint was not perfect, it didn't have to be. Um, but it, it was important and relevant that when the, the employer realized that that corrective action was not perfect, it immediately sprung to action and removed that coworker from site. So another case that was was filed, decided, and decided in favor of the employer. The final case I want to mention was, was one involving another public sector employer. This was Niagara County. This particular case was actually handled by our firm and a couple and two of our partners out of our Buffalo office. The complaint was filed shortly after the amendments took effect, and the decision was issued just July of 23. So it took about almost four years for it to work through the pipeline. Uh, again, the, we, were, we were able to successfully defend our client and have the complaint dismissed. In that case, the complaint it was, a, again, a female employee who alleged that she had been a subject to sexual harassment. Uh, the claim that was applied under the new standard was an interaction with an individual uh, supervisor uh, who also was named as an individual respondent in the case, where the, the complainant alleged that when she uh, walked in, the, the individual respondent greeted her, said, good morning. The complainant sort of gave a short shrift response of, hey, without more. And the, the uh, respondent said, I'll remember that girl. And she considered that comment to be inappropriate. That was the basis of harassment claim. The judge in that case, again, found that it did not rise to the level of something that's more than a petty slight or a trivial inconvenience and dismissed the claim. Now, what was relevant in that case was the complainant acknowledged that that exchange, including the comment by the respondent that she took offense to, was all intended to be a sort of a funny exchange back and forth between the two of them. She acknowledged that that was the intent and that was relevant to the judge's decision to dismiss the complaint. Um, if there was, I think, evidence that this was uh, unwelcome right from the get go or that there was some connection uh, to the, the complainant's race related to this comment, there it's possible that there could have been a different outcome, but that was not uh, raised, litigated or decided in this case and the, the uh, claim was dismissed. So those are three of the four decisions that we received back from the division response to our parole request. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Emily Alquist, to talk about the fourth decision, give you a brief summary of that case. Thank you. Um, the last decision that applied the new standard involved a female complainant who brought a claim of sexual harassment against her former employer and two former coworkers. Um, the main respondent in that case um, was a former co-worker of the complainant, uh, Respondent Wolf. Um, the facts in that case were that the complainant alleged that the respondent on one occasion held a piece of wood 
with a magnet to the back of her head to insinuate that she had a metal plate in her head. And on another occasion stated that he would, quote, hate to be married to her. Further, the complainant alleged that on another occasion, the respondent deliberately and physically blocked her while she was walking to her desk and that she had to push by him to get to her desk. Um, as stated prior in, in all the decisions, the division also in this decision dismissed the case. Um, in doing so, the division found that one, the magnet incident did not have any connection to the complainant's sex, dismissed it on that basis. Um, two, although the marriage comment did have a connection to the complainant's sex, it was considered, quote, workplace banner and thus no more than a petty slight. Um, finally, and most significantly, although the division ultimately found that the complainant did not support the physical blocking allegation, um, it also explained that if such an allegation had been supported, it certainly would have been more than a petty slight or trivial inconvenience. And as such, the employer would have been entitled to the affirmative defense. Um, so although it so far appears on the new standard that the division has not yet found for a complainant, the analysis in this case was particularly relevant um, because it showed that um, if the alleged harassing conduct is certain comments that a respondent made, the respondent may be entitled to the affirmative defense if it can show that such comments were only workplace banter, even if the comments related to a complainant's protected characteristic. Thanks, Emily. And, and just to, to sum up uh, and give you a couple of takeaways, what we see from this is that well, the division continues to see physical conduct as being particularly significant. So if it, instances of conduct where a, a complainant is physically touched, uh, particularly in, in private areas, it raises the most risk and the most likelihood of adverse decision for an employer. Uh, but now, under this lighter standard, even instances where blocking the, the pathway of, a, of an employee may be enough to, to uh, sustain a complaint, at least bring it to hearing, uh, particularly if the, if the complainant can show that that conduct occurred because of their protective characteristic. Uh, so the, and I think gossip is another issue that, that these cases suggest it continues to be a significant uh, focus point for the division and that judges could find against an employer if there's evidence that that there is specific types of uh, commentary and discussion going on about the complainant, the complainant becomes aware of it, but it has an impact on their employment and the employer, uh, particularly if the employer becomes aware of it, doesn't take prompt action to address it. Those certainly raise risks for that employer of, of an adverse finding. Now, with all that said, I do want to mention a couple of additional things. We are, th this new standard doesn't just apply to sexual harassment claims. It applies to any type of harassment uh, protected under the New York State Human Rights Law. We are continuing to, to keep pace on decisions. And uh, if we get additional decisions, responses, FOIA requests, or other information uh, relevant to the application of the standard that we believe is of, of value to you and, and insightful. We'll certainly uh, share it with you either through webinars or through other publications. And, and hopefully that will help advance and give you a further understanding of how this new standard will be applied. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Gabe and thank you all. Thank you, Sanjeev, and thank you, Emily. Really appreciate the presentations from our full uh, complement of attorneys today. And with that, thank you very much, Kathy, for forwarding uh, or advancing to the next slide where the contact information is available for each of the attorneys who presented. Of course, you can reach out to me if you have uh, any question at all as well. I look forward to being back with you in two weeks on the 19th. In the interim, you'll have um, Kristen Smith as your host on the 12th and a full array of topics uh, that she'll be covering, including, we expect, on the CDC and COVID. So stay tuned for that. Um, in the interim, wishing you a terrific balance of your days. And thank you for your loyalty to the program. We really appreciate it.